Hello and welcome to Dialogue and Debate with Cumberland Lodge. Welcome to those joining us for the first time and welcome back to our regular viewers. Last week we had a constructive conversation on how government, faith communities, charities and NGOs can best support those affected by death, many of whom currently face restrictions on funerals. If you missed it, uh, you can watch it via our website, cumberlandlodge.ac.uk, where you'll also find a link to the LSE research that the panelists were discussing. Today, we're pleased to welcome four, three new guests to discuss polarization and the pandemic, and we'll be discussing the extent to which COVID-19 unites people across political divides. It's very good to have with us Professor Graham Smith, Professor of Politics and Director of the Centre for the Study of Democracy at the University of Westminster, and a long-time friend of Cumberland Lodge. We also have with us Will Tanner, founding director of the think tank Onward, and Tessa Van Rens, researcher at the cross-party think tank Demos. Welcome to you all. To those of you uh, watching this morning, do please get involved. You can submit any question you'd like to put to our guests as we go along. So if you're watching live on Zoom, you can submit questions via the Q&A function. You can also tweet at Cumberland Lodge, or you can comment on our Facebook live stream. But let's start, first of all, with, with Will. Will, perhaps you could just say something a bit about, about your work and then share with us your thoughts on whether COVID-19 has brought the country together and whether it's healing partisan divides. Thank you very much, Ed, and thank you for having me uh, at this discussion. Um, well, I think, um, so in terms of Onward's work, Onward is a, a, uh, an independent think tank that has been doing uh, work on the kind of big social and economic challenges facing the country for two years. And I think for the purposes of this discussion, uh, one of the areas of our work that is most relevant is a program that we call Repairing Our Social Fabric, which is looking at how to, um, uh, how to measure and uh, understand the ways in which community uh, is changing and uh, can be strengthened in the United Kingdom and in all types of community around, around the UK. Um, and as part of that work, we've been doing quite a lot of work through the COVID crisis to understand how communities have responded. Uh, we've done field work in three different parts of the UK, Glasgow, uh, Barking and Dagenham and Grimsby uh, and we've also done quite extensive polling and, and, and policy development work too. Um, my first reaction to your question is um, is just to take one step back and to just uh, recognise the levels of polarisation that existed before the crisis because I think it's quite important to understand what how we were as we were going in um, and in terms of uh, the UK I think we have been experiencing a period of, of pretty unprecedented polarization for some time. Obviously, the Brexit debate looms pretty large in this, uh, in this scenario, but we also have seen uh, much higher levels of political volatility at the ballot box, many more people switching party between elections, for example. Obviously, a, a result at the last election that few people predicted. Um, and, uh, and a kind of a growing sense of detachment from partisan politics and a, and a growing sense of polarization across attitudinal and cultural divides. In particular, um, we are seeing the growth of a kind of cognitive cultural divide between educated uh, people, that some people call them elites, and, um, and people with lower levels of education who are perhaps um, uh, limited in terms of the levels of status, dignity, and an economic opportunity that um, had been afforded to previous generations of people with lower levels of education. Um, and we are also seeing, I think, uh, or we have seen quite a significant degree of geographic polarization too. One of the reasons why the government focuses particularly on leveling up is the, the kind of the sheer divergence between London and the South East in particular and, and various other parts of the country. So, so my starting point for all of this is we were already incredibly polarized. Um, uh, but I think what we've seen in the last 10 weeks or so, um, and which has caught many people by surprise, is an outpouring of civic mindedness and public spiritedness. Um, and uh, uh, in many ways, the kind of first phase of this crisis, because I really do think we are at the, at the beginning of this rather than nearing the end, is, um, uh, is a sense of kind of 
well, we've seen kind of small acts of kindness. We've seen hundreds of thousands of people volunteer through the NHS app and through other avenues. Um, and in all of our work, we found um, a kind of extraordinary level of community spiritedness, spiritedness. We found that people were more likely to worry about the jobs and financial welfare and the health and uh, kind of mental well-being of uh, their community than they were of themselves or indeed their own immediate family. So people people really are thinking about others at this moment, or at least they have been for the last 10 weeks. Um, uh, and and, and that, I think that extends in a number of different ways uh, as well, um, uh, not just in the kind of volunteering space, but in in, in terms of people ge people's general demeanor, it has been a kind of uh, a civic uh, spirit that has characterized the first stage of this crisis. However, um, I worry quite significantly about the the limits on that. Um, uh, if you look at the kind of field of disaster sociology, actually the immediate period after a crisis is usually followed by a period of, her of heroism and, and kind of public spiritedness. But that comes to an end at some point when people start to realize the limits of their own ability to help others um, and the fact that life will not necessarily go back to normal. Um, and it's at that moment that polarization can quite clearly set in. Um, the other thing that I think is quite is quite noticeable and is up until now, really, we've all been living by the same restrictions and rules, barring the two million shielded population. Broadly, everyone has been subjected to the same level of, of kind of government restriction. Um, we are now starting to see rules diverge for different groups of people um, and uh, potentially some different groups in society um, being less affected financially in terms of their health impact um, uh, than others. Uh, and I think as that starts to bite, there is a risk that uh, the kind of us and them mentality, which is so fundamental to social and political polarization starts to, starts to seep in. Um, just the final thing I would add is that uh, I think in the last week or two, you have started to see divergence between the main parties and lots of the polling evidence starts to show that whereas previously partisan designs didn't really matter in terms of how people responded to issues around COVID, increasingly they are uh, becoming uh, entrenched in the way in which they were previously around, especially around the kind of Brexit division, the Remain, the Remain leave um, kind of uh, dichotomy that has characterised British politics for the last three or four years. And um, if that continues, then I think we are likely to see a growing level of polarisation. Um, so it's up to politicians, I think, to to respond to that by by trying at all times to 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 be demonstrating the kind of unity and harmony harmony of the approach and subjecting people to broadly similar rules rather than creating artificial divides between people. Thank you very much indeed, Tess. That quite neatly leads on to to your world with with yeah. demos and cross party. Um, think tank work. Uh, do you think that political polarisation is dangerous uh, for society or is it beneficial for society to have some degree of, of polarity? Um, so in response to that question, I think the first thing I'll do is somewhat challenge uh, what Will was saying, as is customary, I think, for a debate, um, <laughs> on the levels of polarisation pre-COVID. Uh, King's College makes a really useful distinction between two types of polarization. There's issue-based polarization, which is about if you look at people's opinion on a spectrum, to what extent are they towards the extremes of the, that spectrum? And effective polarization, which is about the emotions that feel, people feel and very much about the extent to which we believe that we belong to different groups, right? And that's um, like we'll refer to the, this us and them rhetoric. Um, and I think particularly the second type of polarization is one that we should be worried about. Whereas the first type of polarization, um, increasing amounts of disagreement to some extent, that is just a consequence of, of living in a pluralist democracy. Um, and I think the, the main thing between the two of these to be wary of is what is the, what kind of debate are we having about those issues that we're polarized on? If, there's lots of issue-based polarization and people are on two opposite spectrums, but they're able to have respectful debates with each other, empathize with the other side, um, then I don't think that is a danger at all. And maybe it's, it's even, it even promotes better decision-making because all different types of ideas, even the ridiculous or extreme sounding ones 
are brought up and are discussed and are part of uh, some sort of compromise that we might form. But if we get to the effective polarization, the, the us and them, the problem with that is that we become unable to empathize with the other side. And in a way that makes discussion or compromise or cohesion completely impossible. Um, and I think what happened with Brexit is that what was indeed quite a lot of issue-based polarization was perhaps somewhat overstated in the way that it also created effective polarization. Um, there's lots of different levers that, that created these things like Twitter algorithms, which obviously forefront, as I think most of us know, the more extreme opinions because they garner more likes or, or even more hatred, but more engagement. Um, the media often chooses to amplify more extreme, more polarized voices and the way that our parliament is set up as well with a two party system um, creates this, this real image of, of an issue both polarization that exists, but then also of a real us and them. Um, and research that we did at Demos called the Political Division Index, we tried to drill in to, to what extent are people really unable to talk to each other? Does that us and them really exist? And what we found is, yes, there's loads, lots of disagreement, especially on Brexit and immigration. Those were the two with the most disagreement. But even on those, um, and Brexit as well, people's ability to empathize with the other side was still there. And the majority of the population um, is still very open to having conversations and interesting in having conversations, wants to find a compromise, wants to listen to others. Um, so I would argue that what coronavirus has done actually is taken away some of that, you know, constant attention and media bubble and also political bubble around Brexit that made it seem like that created this narrative of, oh, we have this society and there's a rift in the middle and everyone on either side hates each other. And, and that goes even beyond the issue of Brexit that, that goes very deep and we can't communicate with each other anymore. Can we even live together? And now in the middle of a crisis, it seems that we can live together. You know, neighbors everywhere are helping each other. And I think we've all seen the examples. I personally haven't seen any examples of someone bringing their neighbor medicine and then starting a debate about Brexit. I think what's interesting is that a, a crisis has, a crisis and the fear that comes from it has this ability to, to focus our mind on something. And that can be a collective focus where we all focus on the same thing, i.e. beating coronavirus. Um, but it can also be a focus into groups, which would be an us and them focusing on the other people as the enemy. Um, and so far, by and large, what I've seen is a collective focus on trying to beat this enemy of coronavirus and uh, less, a lot of the polarization that we saw and that was represented around Brexit kind of falling to the wayside because of that. Um, and I think that is, that is a really positive thing. What does happen with that bubble as it's represented with that, that over-representation of polarization in politics and the media and on social media is that the longer you do that for, the more true it becomes. I think if we keep telling people that Brexiteers and Leavers hate each other, or in the, in the context of the crisis, if we keep telling people that, you know, there's the good people over here and then there's COVID idiots breaking the rules, being selfish, selfish over there, or maybe, um, you know, there's people from Asia who've caused the crisis and there's everyone else over here. If we keep creating that narrative, ultimately that is gonna to lead to actual effective polarization. But I think as things stand right now, I'm perhaps more positive than most about our ability to empathize with everyone and our ability to use this crisis as an opportunity to focus our minds on the things that perhaps matter more than being a leaver or a remainer. Um, and then, in terms of the question whether we need some polarity, I think having some issue-based polarity is good. Um, having this, that affecting the us and them polarity is definitely not good. And the government, and as well as the media, carry quite a big responsibility. And, and here I obviously agree with Will in how they present this, you know, which, which narrative are they choosing to create? And I think what can be difficult sometimes is if, with COVID is if the rules are Quite unclear and people aren't really sure what to do um, or perhaps if the rules are unrealistic or too difficult to follow then that automatically creates these different groups of people who are making their personal moral decisions around different things than other people are making their personal moral decisions on so I think the collectiveness there of saying 
this is our goal, this is what we want to reach, um, and these are the things that we should all try and do in order to get there, is really important in still allowing space for that issue-based polarization, for that, that all-important disagreement, and trying to find compromise, but not creating from the Brexit us and them narrative, a new us and them narrative, um, or entrenching the same one deeper. Thank you very much, Tessa. Before we go on to Graham, just a quick reminder to those uh, viewing that if you'd like to ask a question, you can use the Q&A function on Zoom, tweet at Cumberland Lodge, or comment on our live stream on Facebook. And if you want to remain anonymous, please direct message us on Facebook or Twitter. Well, Graham, um, we're living in strange times and uh, things are, are happening that we probably didn't expect. I just wonder whether you think in this sort of uh, COVID world, whether going forward, it might help us to think about doing democracy in different ways. Yeah, um, first of all, th thanks Ed for inviting me and um, pleasure to be on the panel with Will and Tessa. Um, yeah, I wanted to pick up a couple of comments that have been made and, and, and riff off those. The, the first is this, and I think it's, it's right, you know, this kind of rhetoric of we're all in this together and COVID being a great leveller. And I, I do have some worries about that from a democratic perspective, because I think that rhetoric papers over the reality of the health crisis and the future economic crisis that's going to, be, that's going to come in its wake. Um, because COVID is being experienced so differently in so many different parts of our population in different communities. Um, it's right what Tess is saying and, and, and in terms of people uh, and what Will was saying about the sort of civic mindedness, but also we've got to recognise that, that COVID is exacerbating existing inequalities or previous inequalities and actually creating new ones. So particular groups in society are more vulnerable to the virus, particular groups in society are having to continue to go out to work during the virus, often putting themselves at great personal risk particular groups are going to be hardest hit in terms of income and um, particular groups find it harder to live through the crisis. I'm thinking about those with young children in cramped accommodation, those with no access to green spaces, um, people with mental health conditions, those vulnerable to domestic violence, that sort of thing. And what I, what I think is fine, has been fine up to now is that sort of capacity to, to have a blanket response to that. But I think that um, my, my feeling is that we're beginning to see political decision making that doesn't reflect that diversity of experience and doesn't diver, diver, reflect that sort of uh, that, that that sort of the, the sort of inequalities that are inherent within the COVID, within our response to the pandemic, but also in in what comes next. And government is going to have to make some really significant short term decisions, medium term decisions about you know post pandemic economic stimulus, those sorts of things, and long term about you know how we make ourselves ready for something else like this in the future potentially and I think actually that's really where our democracy is is, is lacking at the moment and partly that's um, because we've we've got a quite a closed group of people with very similar social backgrounds making decisions for us and I think lacking understanding and imagination and their imaginations are limited in terms of their own social perspectives about the lived experience of many people within our population and so and at the same time, we are starting to see this, and I've, you know, um, I've actually a, a slight drop in trust in the government, or not a slight drop, quite a, quite a significant drop in trust, trust in the government. And I think um, one way that we might, I, I, so I, th I think that the, the, we have a very highly centralised political decision making and political system in the UK. And I think there's a real, real um, urgency here to start looking at more participatory and deliberative ways of engaging people in decisions that affect their lives such that decisions are made that understand and respect that diversity and decisions are made that people can trust and people can accept more readily. And so I think, I think I, I agree in the sense like at this moment, we've had this really interesting kind of um, moment when people come together, when there is a sense of togetherness. But I, my, I, I have this worry that our democratic processes and systems aren't going to be responsive enough to the kind of difference we have out there. And if they're not responsive, then I think we start to see the potential for more sorts of the emergence of more destructive forms of polarisation. Perhaps we can just tease that out a bit with, with, with all three of you in, you know, what, if you were trying to make democracy more um, participatory, what are the sorts of things practically do you think that would, uh, we could be doing? 
do you want me to jump in there? Do you want to fire, fire off ground first and then get... Okay, so I mean, what, one of the... So the, the, there are all sorts of things that one can do at local nev level right the way through to national level. And one, one of the interesting challenges about this is we were actually developing some really interesting ways of doing democracy differently through things like citizens' assemblies, through things like participatory budgeting and other sorts of participatory processes. But actually, of course, a lot of those talk bring people together, <laughs> physically bring people together. And so we're actually scrabbling around at the moment, trying to work out what we can do digitally. But it was really interesting, just for example, that the UK Climate Assembly was able to hold its last weekend bringing people together on, uh, you know, using actually this, this technology. And so people are out there at the moment trying to think creatively about how we bring people together. And I think there are some really interesting technologies and techniques for doing this. And I, th and I think it's a real important time for experimentation. My worry is that actually public officials are very conservative in the way that they do policy and are actually very resistant to this kind of experimentation that, that, we, that we really need to see. Thank you. Um, Will or Tessa, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. I think um, at Demos, we've been experimenting with quite a lot of different uh, ways of, of doing online listening exercises and things like that, uh, because one of our sort of important goals is, has always been to bring the people more actively into policymaking. Um, we've actually just launched a Life After COVID, or it's called Renew Normal Commission, where we try to bring in as many people from as many different walks of life representing that diversity um, to talk about and to listen to how their life has changed during COVID, what of those things they like, which of those things they don't like and then would like to see go back to normal or see a new version of it. Um, and I think those types of things are really important. One point I would make, and I think this becomes all the more important online, um, because of the distance that's created and the anonymity that's created, is that it can be an incredible tool to listen to people and give them more space to speak. But it can also, as I think a lot of us have seen, can be a tool to only amplify certain voices, only amplify the loudest. Um, and but in that way also recreate and exacerbate a lot of the inequalities that already exist in a real life debate, right? We've seen um, a lot of research I've read on this is that on a lot of platforms, the exact same people that would get to speak um, in a political environment or maybe at um, any group of people, even in a business context, uh, well-educated, often male, often white, are the same people that speak more online. So we, there are a lot of methods for this, but we really have to think well about the, the methodologies and the different ways that these systems work to make sure that you don't get the opportunity to yell over others um, and you don't, you don't really get that opportunity um, to stop others from speaking. But I do think those things already exist. Uh, but as Graeme said, governments in general need to be a little bit more innovative with experimenting with those and not just think, oh, well, Twitter's not great. So let's not do that, which maybe that's the process of thought. I'm not sure. Will, anything you'd like to bring into the discussion? Yes, I, um, so I am very supportive of participatory democracy initiatives and uh, and think that we need to do much more to involve ordinary citizens in the decision making about their lives. But I have I have a hesitation around it in the sense that I think um, uh, too often uh, participatory democracy and citizens assemblies in particular are seen as a substitute for good institutional quality or good governance of of public sector institutions and we um, we effectively use a citizens assembly or, or equivalent as a, as a plaster to, to stick on top of what is really a gaping wound in, in the kind of British uh, democratic model, which is the, uh, the poor quality and lack of institutional strength, um, uh, especially at a, a local and regional level within the UK. Um, and I think actually the most transformative thing the government could do is not to necessarily uh, embark on a new model of democracy, but to strengthen uh, the long established um, institutions that already exist, which have been let, let to wither on the vine really. Um, uh, so uh, by which I mean local authorities, uh, um, uh, I would personally look at hyper-local systems of government as well, or governance as well. So. Um, uh, it's a slightly uh, kind of traditionalist model, but I'm a great fan of 
parish councils as a as a kind of method of uh, of mediating kind of neighbourhood decision making, um, uh, and uh, and I think there is a case for a, for a level of regional governance that perhaps doesn't exist at the moment, building on the metropolitan mayors model. But um, at the moment, I feel like um, the kind of British uh institutional quality at a kind of devolution level is 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 um is pretty weak um and uh i think when we're we're probably doing ourselves a disservice if we think that participatory democracy will fill the gap entirely um, we need to do much more on in terms of institutional strength as well and perhaps instead of actually um i would say um the two things aren't mutually exclusive but um but in terms of priority i think institutions are more important than um the new process as it were Thank you. Just a quick reminder to our viewers, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function on Zoom, tweet at Cumberland Lodge or comment on our live stream on Facebook. And if you want to remain anonymous, please direct your message to us on Facebook or Twitter. Now, to those of you who are watching via Zoom, we're going to do a quick poll now to hear some of your thoughts. So the poll question is about to pop up. The question is, do you feel the COVID-19 pandemic has had a generally polarizing or cohesive impact on British politics. So that's the question. And we'll wait for a few people to respond and then we'll get our panelists thoughts on what's coming through. So let's see what's coming up. This is where I might have to- Are the results under your table, Ed? I'm just wondering, unfortunately, I need to move my head to see my screen. So that's why I'm just doing this slight strange maneuver. <laughs> I still can't see any results coming through, but we'll, we'll see. Aha, here we go. So the results are coming through. So 20% um, said polarizing, 20% said cohesive, 40% said neither and 20% said not sure. So there we are. So that's the, the, the results so far. Is that, does that seem right to, uh, to our panelists? Do you think that's sort of fair assessment? Well, I suppose it kind of depends what, what we take to mean British politics. I think something that all three of us have referred to is how society feels more cohesive at the moment. Um, mm -hmm but that doesn't necessarily mean that what's happening in Westminster feels more cohesive. Um, and if anything, something that I've noticed is that quite a lot of the, some anger uh, that was perhaps first directed at other people or wherever it went is now among a lot of people directed at uh, the government and what's happening there. Um, so I think I kind of agree that it's neither because in a way that's almost feels to a lot of people, as we've pointed out in, in terms of this gap in democracy, what's happening in politics feels a bit separate, too separate maybe from what's what's going in, on in society and everyday people helping each other. Um, so I think I think that's probably where the, the answer of neither comes from, is from that, that disconnect. I, so I agree with that. I also think it's, it is just too early to tell, isn't it? I mean, I think, I think we are like, uh, the effects of this crisis are going to be felt for some time uh, and as as Graham made uh, very clear it's going to affect different people in different ways uh, and people will respond in different ways as well. Um, uh, certainly it feels like the political debate about uh, the various government interventions during this crisis has only just begun and really uh, the government hasn't yet really started to be held accountable for the things the decisions it's made and the, and the rationale for those decisions and we may not even understand the rationale for those decisions um uh, for many months so it feels to me that that we should perhaps uh, kind of hold our fire on whether or not this is polarized british politics um to date because there's, there's some way to go yeah i i i've just added i think i think it's a really interesting moment at the mo at right now because we are seeing a sort of uh, as been mentioned as kind of backlash towards the government um and it does appear without making any political points here it does appear as though the government hasn't has made some poor decisions in this and that is opening up this space for 
sort of partisan politics to emerge and it's really not clear how that's going to play out against a, a population that's been asked to do these various kinds of uh, make these kind of self this kind of sacrifices uh, we are just really in in a position that none of us can there's no there's no there's nothing we can generalize from there's nothing that we've seen before that looks like this so we're really scrabbling around i've got a professor in front of my name but that doesn't help at all you know we're all we're all we're all really you know um, this is new this is really unusual unusual time yeah. and the then the university of life graham we're in in big time so it's, uh, sorry say again it's the university of life in big time so uh, <laughs> yeah learning around that can i just go back to um something we were talking about a bit earlier which is about um using digital uh, technology for participatory politics and I suppose one of the, the issues that does come up is that we are obviously we're living in this world at the moment where we're learning to use Zoom and all sorts of technologies in, in very, very constructive ways. But there are, of course, many people who can't access this. And if we're moving into a, into a more digital age, as it were, accelerating into a more digital age, what are the dangers there with those that, um, for various reasons, can't access it, uh, just simply can't use the, use the technology? Is that something we need to be very uh, wary of going forward? Um, yeah, I mean, for, for, for me, this is one of the sort of um, ways in which COVID is actually exacerbating inequalities and maybe even creating, creating new ones. I was listening to a podcast last night where People were talking about how jobs, you know, people are going to think much more about having jobs in terms of um, working at home. Some of the point, you know, that these are going to actually be the, the kind of uh, new working arrangements. And uh, so someone suggested, well, maybe people will look to see what postcode you're in, to see whether you've got a decent Wi-Fi access, you know, in order to give you in order that you can do that kind of working from home, etc. You know, people start to say in the same way at the moment, we say, you know, have you got a car for certain jobs or whatever, you know, um, have you got a particular type of Internet access? And it's quite clear there are significant digital divides, not only in terms of access to the technology, which is really which is which is clearly clear problem, but also in terms of people's confidence in, in, in terms of their willingness to use this. And we are this is for me a really important social division that is going to map onto the kind of cultural um, and cognitive um, division that Will was talking about earlier in terms of that sort of polarisation. So I think internet use very, very much maps that kind of uh, that that existing um, divide. Um, it, just to just one other thing, it's really important. We can do participation well online. We can do deliberation well online, but you have to design it incredibly carefully and in the way that um, Tessa was talking about. Otherwise, the same old people dominate. But we know that from participation offline and we've got to make sure we bring those lessons online as well any comments from tester or will on that so so i'd agree that i with graham that i think there's a risk that kind of increasing dependence on digital technology does exacerbate previous divides and shuts people out of democratic processes um, in a way that previously they would have had access uh, physically. Um, uh, and you can see that you can see that in everything from uh, from ability to uh, engage with uh, kind of parliamentary process, lots of which is now happening online right through to um, uh, right through to uh, ability to go and uh, visit your local town hall or, or, or kind of be involved in, in local democracy. Um, the, the one thing I would say, though, is I think that there is a there, there is a double a, a kind of another side to this in the sense that um, uh, so it, it kind of the move online can be democratizing in and of itself. Um, and we do have a system, certainly economically in this country, where um, people's opportunity is significantly tied to their ability to um, buy a house or, or rent a home um, in specific travel to work areas uh, or the ability to um, to access kind of local labor markets um, within our major metropolitan cities largely. Um, and the move to a more online world, um, this is perhaps a more economic point rather than democratic point, um, does potentially open up significant opportunities for people who previously didn't have them. Um, now that won't be true in all cases, um, and there are lots of jobs which will still require proximity. But if we do move to a world where there is much less 
presenteeism in terms of in terms of employment, um, then uh, then that, that could be democratizing for for people's opportunity to uh, to economic um, value and uh, and jobs um, and 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 social engagement too. So I think we just we just need to understand that there are two sides to this, and there are I mean as with all innovations, um, there are huge opportunities. You just need to mitigate the downside, um, and that's really where I think politicians need to be focusing. They should be embracing innovation. Uh, disruption can be really positive, um, and certainly I think. Um, COVID may have accelerated a number of trends which were happening anyway. This is none of this was really new. It was just happening in slower time. Um, but we need to we need to work quite quickly, I think, to understand where the where some of the risks lie for certain groups and put in place uh, mitigations to to prevent them from falling through the cracks. Yeah, absolutely. I would um, agree with all of that and. One other group that I think this whole development is really interesting for is is people with disabilities, right? Um, in that the way that they've always wanted to work and probably many of them would have been able to work but didn't get that opportunity that on the one hand it's great that those opportunities are now coming up. On the other hand, I think it's a bit painful that it was always possible but not for them. Um, and yeah, I absolutely agree with Will that it's it's just a matter of thinking through the risks. Um, another risk that we haven't really talked about yet is, is loneliness and isolation. Um, for lots of people, the, the where they go to work and, and having that physical interaction with other people um, might be some of the only interactions they have. And so while one group might be more included into the workplace, other groups might be more excluded into the workplace or included in the workplace and excluded socially because they happen to live alone uh, or any of those things. So ultimately it's just a matter of really thinking through all of those risks and as Graham has pointed out before making sure that in doing that we really listen to people's different experiences you know all of us can theorize about oh this is what this group's experiencing and this is what this group's experiencing I mean, ultimately any solution and any way forward has to involve all of those groups asking them how's it going what are you experiencing is this a benefit for you how could it be better? Uh, and making sure that policies are tailored to that, to all of those different um, diverse experiences. Can I ask a question that's come in about um, the uh, different voices that need to participate in democracy? We're seeing this is a very, very big issue that's affecting just every aspect of life. And to expect politicians to be able to navigate us through, through all this is, is unrealistic. So how do we get um, the diverse views uh, right across society engaged in thinking thinking in a post-COVID, hopefully a post-COVID world. Go with Graham, what is something that you might want to pick up on? Yeah, I mean, it, so a lot of this depends upon what you're trying to do. So, for example, um, there are certain issues that we know that the government needs to deal with which are going to affect particular vulnerable communities, particular communities hardest, but it's quite clear that's the community you need to go and engage with. So there's no point in having a mass, a mass um, um, engagement around something which is specific to a particular community. So um, sometimes you see these open consultations, which actually really only affect a particular, which are ma mainly affect a particular community. So, so some things we do can be targeted. There are other things we can do where we explicitly bring together a diverse body of citizens, a diverse body of participants. Um, and you can do that through their particular selection techniques like civic lotteries, using sortition, for example, where we're bringing together people with very, very different lived experiences. And this is the kind of theory behind the sort of citizens assemblies that we've seen in, in over recent years. And then there are other really interesting things that are emerging around um, digital technology, which allow you to actually get inputs from large groups of people and to get and, and collate and curate them in really interesting ways. And one of the leaders here is actually Taiwan. They've got, they use these um, uh, platforms like polis, P-O-L dot I-S, which allows you to um, curate lots and lots of comments from people and lots and lots of ways of understanding where people agree, where they disagree, where there are areas of, uh, of where, where they're unsure. So we do actually have really innovative ways of doing this. We do actually have a lot of insights into how to engage different populations in different ways. What we lack, and I mentioned this before, is the political will and political imagination to actually do this. Yeah. Um... 
I, I completely agree with Graham. Uh, it's interesting that you brought up uh, Polis. We've actually just started using that uh, mm -hmm. at Demos. And what I find really exciting about it is, and how it's different from, for example, uh, Twitter and other things we've talked about is that it doesn't necessarily allow people to debate with each other, but it gives the space for an individual person to be to say pretty much everything that they think about a topic. I think often what we do is we have these surface level discussions and Brexit is a really good example of this where people almost take up positions of like a caricature of themselves and that's just bumping heads all the time rather than figuring out what be, what people's actual experiences are. Um, I've been working with an organization called Build Up um, who did a really interesting anti-polarization initiative uh, in the US where they engaged with people online who they thought were showing polarizing behavior. And one of the single most effective ways to start a good conversation with someone who disagreed with them, for example, uh, someone who was posting about Make America Great Again, was to ask them, what does that mean to you, that slogan? Why do you care about this slogan? And it's something that is so deceptively simple, but people genuinely got emotional in response to it and said, wow, no one's ever asked me that. Oh, oh, everyone always only tells me why I'm wrong. They never ask what it means to me and why, why I'm posting about this online. So I think um, Polis is a great way to, to get that, that breadth, breadth of experiences in terms of diversity, but also depth of experience from each individual person. Um, because most things can be captured in just one sentence or one statement or one opposing statement. Um, yeah, and I think that's what we need to be doing. Um, I am going to use this opportunity to do a slight bit of a plug. Uh, we've launched the Life After COVID Commission with at Demos, where we're hoping to get as many people as possible from the UK to fill out a survey and share any and all of their experiences with COVID. From that, we're we're going to make sure to build different changes. And again, in in engaging with the public, test those different ideas of uh, how we might develop from here. It's called uh, Renew Normal. Um, yeah, so I think those are the kind of things that we need to go towards. Thank you. Will, is there anything you wanted to add to what's been said? Well, I think so. I think Tessa and Graham are probably more expert than me on specific tools and uh, and kind of mechanisms for doing this. Um, the thing, just just to be slightly kind of counter uh, or counterintuitive or, or, or kind of um, provocative, I think um, it's interesting that at the moment we have a government that thinks that certainly believes that there's more in touch with ordinary people's opinion than previous governments um, and does uh, does more, uh, certainly in terms of traditional research, more research into the mood of the population uh, and specific voter groups in particular than previous governments uh, undertook uh, in terms of focus groups, in terms of extensive uh, kind of daily and weekly polling on, on key issues. Um, uh, and I know that lots of that data has been at the heart of some of the government's COVID decision making as well. They're keen to, as with anything that involves kind of big behavioural changes within a population, they're keen to ensure that they understand how the public would feel about specific announcements before they make them. Um, so it's it's interesting to me that we have a we have a government that um, is actively seeking to root its its policies and behaviour in, in the kind of views of the population. And at the same time, we're having a conversation about kind of rising polarisation and, uh, and a kind of potential differentiation between, uh, between politics and, 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 and the people. Um, and so th there is a slight dichotomy there. I don't, it, to some degree, I don't think it's, um, uh, I, th I, th I think these are just two slightly different ways of understanding and responding to popular mood. There is a kind of very participatory way that tries to involve people and there is a more uh, kind of receptive way that, that tries to kind of test things and then direct. Um, and there is a question in my mind as to how much, uh, and I use these terms lightly, but kind of ordinary people, kind of your everyday family, um, wants to be genuinely part of a decision-making process or just wants to be listened to. Um, and I think those are two very different processes. Um, and I'm not yet convinced that everyone wants to participate in the process, um, uh, but they certainly want to be listened to. And I think some of the reasons why we've had polarisation just going back to my initial comments, why we've had polarization in the last few years has been because people haven't felt listened to, not because they haven't felt uh, that there's been an avenue for them to participate. 
Yeah, I just want to jump in there, Ed. I, I actually, I think Will's right here. You know, there's, there's a kind of, this kind of uh, utopian idea sometimes amongst parties between deliberative democracy that every Democrats, that everybody just wants to participate all the time. And we just know this isn't true. It's just, it's just um, you know, just wrong, uh, empirically wrong. Um, but what we do know is that, um, is if you invite people to, to do something which is substantial and substantive, people, a significant amount of people are interested in doing that. I think there is a difference with what Will's talking about, about a government that is doing a lot of um, polling, et cetera, in order to try and get its political communication right in order, with, with a government that says, we'd like to involve citizens in as part of the decision-making process. I think they are qualitatively different things, um, but I think it, I, I, I take Will's point. We need to start to wind up our conversation, but there's one question that's come in, just which I'd like to pose as the last question, which is about the international dimension to all this. Obviously, it's a, we're facing a national crisis, but it's an international crisis as well. Are there lessons that we can learn from different political uh, systems around the world and how they've been responding to, to COVID? A big question, but uh, interesting to get your perspective on it. We've heard about Taiwan. Any other countries that... Uh, you think, yeah. Taiwan's interesting, actually, because it was one of the most effective responses to COVID, actually, because it used a lot of these kind of techniques. Um, I, I'm really glad I don't live in the United States. I think that's the first thing I'd, I'd say. Um, there is, a, 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 I'm not do, we're doing some advertising here, I guess, but there's, an organ, there's a platform called Participedia, which is trying to collect examples of participatory and deliberative processes around the world. Um, and that's really, it, it's not, you know, it, it will take time because these things are only happening now. But I think that will be an interesting um, space to watch because a lot of this stuff, as, as has been mentioned, happens at local level and isn't, you know, we don't really see it in, in, terms, of, in terms of news. The other thing, I'm, I'm involved in a project with Involve, which is looking at a democratic response to COVID-19. And we're at the moment trying to collate some of that material. And I think it's really early days at the moment in the sense it's early days to read the kind of what does this mean for polarization? It's early days to read what's happening in, in other in other polities as well, I'm afraid. Tessa, is, is Demos looking around the world at the moment? Um, yes, we are, in, but I think more in the sense of, of looking at Taiwan and those types of examples, um, because as others have said, it's almost too early to see how things have played out or I think how things will play out. Um, something that I have noticed um, that I somewhat pointed out before, about getting people to get behind this uh, this common purpose um, in terms of the immediate response to, to COVID and the kind of regulations that we have to follow is this a, a combination of, of clarity and of realism perhaps. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands and what I found quite interesting is that what they did there, um, which I think has had quite a big unifying effect is saying from now on social distancing is in place um, as soon as you're with more than two people and that's going to stay in place for the entire year. So everyone knows what they have to do, but it's also realistic about the fact that it's not, people are not going to be able to not be close to anyone else for an entire year, especially people who live alone or, or don't have a partner or want to go out and meet someone or many different reasons. Um, and I think more in terms of the immediate response rather than the sort of democratic response, I think that one is uh, is a relatively good example, although there's still many other countries that have sort of dealt with it more swiftly and more successfully. Um, I think in terms of bringing people together, but behind one concept, I think that, that is quite a good one. Thank you. Will, is there any, are you looking around the world in your work? Well, so, so we do we do look at international experience quite extensively. Um, and I think I would agree broadly that I think it's quite, uh, it's quite difficult at the moment to to understand the extent of or the attempts of success in in other in other polities, as Graham said. But um, the one example that I would point to, which I've I've just always been fascinated by, and it predates COVID, um, is the process that Emmanuel Macron uh, started uh, through en marche with Le Grand Marche and then Le Grand Debat, uh, which was last year. Um, both of which were. Um, were kind of mass participatory exercises in policy making, um, but they crucially um, they started from 
the the world that people wanted to see and the problems that existed in their lives rather than started from specific solutions so there was very much a kind of appreciative inquiry approach um at starting from um starting from basically uh, the ideal world that people uh, wanted and then um, uh, and the on marsh kind of policy advisors then developed policies in order to to substantiate uh, some of those those ideal scenarios and to, and to deliver what people wanted rather than necessarily trying to ask ordinary citizens to do the job of policy development which inevitably is is, is kind of difficult, complicated, um, uh, time consuming and often doesn't, doesn't necessarily always lead to practical solutions. Um, uh, there are examples where that's not true, but I, I, I think the way in which uh, Macron has approached kind of public participation in, in, in democratic uh, democracy in France is, is quite an interesting example that could be applied in other liberal democracies. Thank you very much. Indeed. We need to draw our conversation to a close. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, you can find out more about the work of Cumberland Lodge on our website, uh, cumberlandlodge.ac.uk. And we do hope that you'll join us for our next webinar, next Wednesday, Wednesday uh, the 10th of June at 11 a.m. when we'll be discussing the future of the charity sector with uh, four new guest speakers. You can sign up now on our website and do please spread the word. And if you think someone else you know might be interested in watching dialogue and debate series, do please let them know about it. We currently broadcasting or webcasting uh, on a weekly basis and you can sign up to get alerts about our forthcoming webinars on the Keep in Touch page on our website or simply by emailing us at inquiries at cumberlandlodge.ac.uk. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you especially to our wonderful guests, to Graham, Tessa and Will. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.